Well, I know this is going to come as a shock to many of you who've been uh, following me from the days of Eject, 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 Firewall, Afterburner, Stratosphere Land, but I'm a pilot and I like to fly. I have uh, 975.7 hours of flight time, including an instrument rating, and anything that goes through the air interests me. There's been a lot of talk for years and years and years about flying cars. I've never understood the appeal of flying cars, at least as they've been sold. If I want a flying car, I want to be on the 405, take off and go. But most of the flying cars you see are cars that you can then drive to the airport, put wings on it and take off. Everything that makes a good car makes a bad airplane. Everything that makes a good airplane makes a bad car. Not much interested in all of that. However, Something has uh, attracted my attention, and since Christmas is coming up, and since we here at uh, BillWhittle.com have a Secret Santa program with a strict limit of uh, (laughs) $100,000, I thought I might present to uh, Steve and Scott something that I saw that actually is the first thing that I've seen that goes through the air in quite a long time that actually got my attention, and uh, it's called the Jetson. Guys, uh, the whole idea of air taxis is uh, is a big business. They're, they're major companies, Honda and, and, and Google and everybody, are, are really thinking about the idea of taking the drones that we're so familiar with and scaling them up and then flying people from one place to another. That's an air taxi. That's fine. I have real problems with air taxis. I have problems with air taxis because as a pilot uh, with uh, three complete engine failures in single engine airplanes, I know sometimes things can go wrong. And unlike a helicopter, where if you lose the engine on the helicopter, you can simply use the power of gravity as you descend to auto-rotate the, the, the blades and make a safe landing. Uh, you don't have that option on a lot of these air taxi things. But let me tell you what I like about the Jetson and why, and why it put such a hook into me. When I saw this video, I thought, cool, cool, this is so cool. And the second thing I thought immediately is, if this thing were to lose power right now at this altitude and this speed and were to go right into the ground with that solid steel cage around you, could you survive the impact? Yes or no? And I said, yeah, I think you probably could. Therefore, it's something interested in. I'm uh, something I might be interested in actually flying. Uh, Steve... Uh, when you look at something cool like the Jetson, I realize that this is not a flying car. It's not even really a flying machine. I think this is an off-road vehicle. That's what I think this is. That was is. my first thought. It's, a, it, it's an off-road vehicle that allows you to skim 5, 10, 15 feet above the surface and actually fly. But the idea of taking the Jetson up to even 500 feet, uh, I don't know whether or not it's altitude limited, but I wouldn't do it. And the reason I wouldn't do it is there comes a point where you are high enough to get killed and too low to operate a ballistic parachute. That's about 400 feet, anywhere between about certainly 20 feet and 400 feet. You lose power there. You're out of luck. But as an off-road vehicle, which apparently is limited to a certain speed and a certain height, The worst thing that would happen in a case like that is you'd fly into a tree. And believe me, there are going to be a lot of Jetsons flying into trees. This is my prediction immediately. Nevertheless, it seems like it's survivable. It's kind of a cool idea. Don't you think the idea of a a flying uh, RV instead of taking an ATV or Uh, something like that? My my very first thought, Bill, when uh, on the backstage show available to our members, uh, you had us watch some of this stuff. My first thought, I live in Colorado, was I want to take this thing up into Pike National Forest and let it loose. This would let it go. This, oh, I just I, I'm not going to take it to the grocery store. Where, where are you going to put your groceries? I mean, this is a this is a one man vehicle. I'm not going to take the kids to school in there unless I don't know. I can get the 11 year old. He's still pretty little to hang on to the top. But no, I'm I'm not going to do that. But getting this thing up into the mountains would just be phenomenal. And I think I saw the price there. Something like ninety-two thousand dollars, so a little under a hundred grand. Um, I do in range, guys. It's I do get up into the mountains, and um, before the chip shortage hit, I was pricing Jeep Wranglers, and this blew my mind. But it is very, very easy if you're playing with the little uh, Jeep builder online to get a Wrangler up to sixty thousand dollars. I'm I'm not kidding you. And this is the the Wrangler that was uh, this is the descendant of the original Jeep from the late 1930s that the Army commissioned the development of. It had to be lightweight. It had to be cheap. You know, two guys had to be able to roll it back on its tires and in, in case it in case it rolled. All these specifications for a light 
cheap, capable vehicle. And a modern Wrangler, the Descendant, is this big old four-door beast that you can spec out at well north of $60,000. Um, but for $92,000, instead of having to worry about rolling my Wrangler over because I tackled a boulder that was too big, I could just zoom over it. Sign me up. However, uh, on the Secret Santa thing, since you've already claimed the, uh, uh, the, the Jetson 1, I'd like to put in uh, a note. There is a uh, A4 for sale out in California. I Bill, saw it. And it's going for under a million dollars, just 995000 I realize that's a little higher than the Secret Santa price. That's ridiculous. I mean, we're, the, the Scott and I are not going to come up with $995,000. But we, we, we do have our viewers. 99000 This is within reach of anybody who wants to get a third or fourth job to make their We, we do have our, our viewers. And I'm just saying, I, I don't really have a place to park it. I don't know how to fly it, <laughs> but I want it. <laughs> exactly. I, as we said on the vaccine show, I want a, a, a Boston Robotics Atlas to carry me out to my Jetson that I can then fly across the lake to where I'm going to keep my submersible dolphin thing that jumps. <laughs> oh, they're the retiring Los Angeles uh, class attack subs. I could have one of those, too, if you don't mind. Yeah, why not? Sure. Uh, uh, Scott, you, you brought up something on the backstage show. Where we were talking about whether or not we should do a fun episode or more of the daily grind of misery. Uh, and you said that the, the, one of the reasons we get into the politics is because of the freedom, because it's what the Jetsons all about is having the freedom and the money to, to be able to have fun. Uh, and fun is the is the is the stake that goes right through the heart of, of wokes uh, social justice uh, warriors, by the way. But. Here's one thing I did think about that slowed me down a little bit when it came to my Jetson enthusiasm. Uh, I happen to know a guy who's not just a pilot. I happen to know a guy who is the pilot. He's the only guy who's ever flown around the world non nonstop, unrefueled his nine-day flight, fighter pilot in Vietnam, shot down five uh, uh, distinguished uh, flying crosses, and his name is Dick Rattan. Now, Dick Rattan lived in California, but he's since moved to an undisclosed location. When he lived in California, However, he had a four-wheel vehicle, a Polaris, I think. They're just kind of essentially pretty ATVs, nice dune, yeah. dune buggies. Yeah. And in order to have fun with his Polaris in California, he had to put it on a trailer and drive it for something like five or six hours to find a small part of this giant state that was an authorized, official, off-road vehicle location where you could then do this and then put it back on and drive three hours back. And that takes some of the fun out of things. I'm watching this Polaris thing and I'm thinking, man, you know, no real danger to yourself as things altitude or speed restricted, uh, if it is. Uh, but then I realized, where will you be able to fly it in this uh, People's Republic of California? I imagine I'd have more room and uh, airspace to play around in Texas than I would here in, uh, in uh, the People's Republic of California. Yeah, you might. I mean, the thing's going to kick up some dust, especially if, on takeoff and landing. Um, and it that's depends. the problem of the person behind me. That, that's why I ripped the mirror <laughs> off of this thing. Right, what's behind me is not important. Um, and and let me just start by saying that if this thing is not in the next Bond movie, the franchise is dead uh, because this <laughs> the first the first and most practical use for this thing is to be in like a Bond movie or something like that. Be a great escape um, sequence, you know. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking just of the practical value, in addition to the off-road fun, but the practical value of being able to quickly get a person to a location that requires no more than a 10-foot hole to land um, mm -hmm. and to be able to set that thing down on the side of a hill where somebody's fallen off a cliff or to set that down in, in a situation where you've got to bring supplies to somebody who can't immediately be rescued, uh, to be able to get to those places quickly and get out of there, to bring intelligence about events that are happening in places that are not rapidly accessible. Um, all of those are, are great practical uses for it. Recreationally, I think it would be a ton of fun um, I'm a little scared because, frankly, I grew up with a bunch of motorbike kids. Um, I'd go over to my friend Jack's house and 
and Jack and I and his sisters and his brother and uh, and the Weaver kids, which were just like everybody was a Weaver who wasn't either in Jack's family or my family. The Weaver kids would all be out there on their mini bikes and their little, uh, one of them had one of those three wheel mini bikes and just ripping around in the woods all the time. And I, uh, I was in many situations where I really am surprised that I wasn't part of the child mortality statistics. <laughs> um, and just- That should be something I'm proud of. I know when good hillbillies like us get a hold of something like this, we'll, f- we'll find all kinds of new creative uses for it. But it's just another one of those uh, things that I think when we're arguing about politics or or complaining that the government's not better or objecting to violations of the Constitution, I think every once in a while we need to get out of the the ether of theory and remember why we're having this fight. Uh, the reason for this isn't to have political debates, and if if it is, you're you know you're just on the rhetoric team. You know you're just you're just having a contest of words for no purpose whatsoever. The real purpose of freedom is to make flying cars like the Jetson. This is why this is why we do this. I have this little slogan I use called "Live the Freedom," and I think we forget to live it from time to time. I think we think freedom is a talking point and is not actually an activity. I think there are many of us who would stand up and and uh, you know verbally battle for the Second Amendment who haven't been to the range in such a long time. They're not sure their gun would still work if they got there. Uh, you know, it's that kind of thing. We need to embrace w- the lifestyle. And we don't have to argue politics with somebody who thinks it's wrong that we fly around in the air just five feet off the ground, which by the way, am I the only one who has this dream where you're hovering like five to 10 feet off the ground? I think this is like in the culture. I've Throughout my life, I've had this dream where I'm flying just above the ground. It's so much more exciting than flying at 15,000 feet. To be, yes. to be able to be just above that. Not only do you have the perspective of things whizzing by you, but the fact that you could stop and just be in the air 10 feet off the ground is just so much more thrilling. Anyway, this is awesome. And I'm so glad um, that you brought this up. And uh, is there like a waiting list or do we have to put down $1,000 uh, for a Kickstarter heard, or what are they I've doing? I've heard the first production run is sold out and I'm sure they will uh, all be selling out. And I'm pretty sure we'll, there are a number of vehicles like well, there are a number of, of, of drone-like vehicles, but this one really got my attention specifically for the reasons you just mentioned. Because all of the video of this thing is, is not showing it going up to skyscrapers and shuttling people from one building to another. It's low and slow. And, and, and here's the paradox. First of all, what Scott said is right. There's no point to have freedom if you can't be free and go out and have fun. Uh, this vehicle must be especially uh, uh, uh cause apoplexy among the left because it's fully electric. So there's very few reasons to actually get out there and, you know, to, uh, to protest the thing, but, but it is about freedom. And, and whenever, since people have been people, dreams of flight have always been the dreams of, of the greatest freedom from, 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 since we've been people for, for hundreds of thousands of years, we've envied what birds can do. And, and, and now we can do it. So, there's a lot about this that, that I think is just great. Uh, there are some things about the actual vehicle that I should know, but that would have required a little research, and I'm dead set against that. I think that's a policy we shouldn't start to adopt here. Uh, but with that said, what we know from drones is it is possible to clearly possible to limit the airspeed, clearly easy to limit the altitude. I virtually positive it is a fly by wire system, which means that you are moving a stick and you're telling the computer to send it this way. And then the computer is controlling all the flight controls. There are drones out there now that have collision avoidance things where if they're about to fly into a mountain, they'll stop. I have no doubt that can all be on there too. I just thought I'd close with, with something I noticed about flying and I noticed it relatively late in life after a thousand hours. The paradox of it is that the higher you go, the less it feels like flying. Uh, That the only thing that really feels like real flying is to get low. Uh, I uh, owned and still own half of a very light airplane, very slow airplane, beautiful airplane called a Sky Arrow. It may be the slowest airplane in the sky. Uh, it, it doesn't have an airspeed indicator. It's got a calendar. In the front. <laughs> and I have often often been overtaken by hot air balloons as we went through uh, Banning Pass. But with that said, because it is a slow flying airplane, it can land at a relatively short distance. And when I was flying that from Los Angeles to Tucson, there's a stretch of about a 
about a half an hour worth of flying where it's a, a, a like a wash that comes down. It's not quite a lake bed, but it's, it's perfectly smooth, which in my mind means landable. Uh, I have this bizarre uh, affectation when I'm flying, and that is that I, I always want to come home at the end of the day. And so what I found was, was that you could fly low at 500 feet, which is the basically the legal separation minimum from any object or vehicle. And at 500 feet at 80 knots, you feel much, much faster than you do, much faster than you do at, at, at 35,000 feet at 500 knots. That's real flying. In that one area where the, where the, uh, the entire place was landable, I flew that aircraft at about 80 or 90 knots, and I flew it probably 20 feet above the ground. I did it at 20 feet above the ground because I knew if the engine quit at 90 knots, I come back on the stick and I'm at 500 feet. It gives me plenty of time. All of this simply to say this, there are, there are flight envelopes in virtually all aircraft. In fact, I'll, I'll just come out and say it. I am not aware of a traditional aircraft that does not have some aspect of the flight envelope where it cannot kill you. The, the most forgiving plane ever made was the Piper Cub, and Piper Cub pilots say this plane is so, forgi so forgiving it can just barely kill you. <laughs> the, the, the thing about the Jetson is, is that it's easy to imagine that, that this could be limited to a, to a set of our airspeeds and altitudes where the worst thing that would happen is be the same as driving a four-wheel ATV into a tree. In other words, bad day, hurt yourself call the insurance company, go home. Uh, my hope is not that this vehicle um, will succeed. It will succeed. And my hope is not that I'll own one. I'll own one one day, I have no doubt. My hope is that when I do finally own one, I'll be able to actually take it places and not be uh, restricted to a three mile radius in an, in an approved um, Jetson flying zone where me and 17 other people are trying to to find a you know a hundred yards open where we can where we can actually enjoy ourselves. What's the point of freedom and technology if we if we allow ourselves to be to be tied down by laws from people who have no dreams of flying, no desire to fly, and whose idea of freedom is the freedom to tell other people what to do? For Steve Green and Scott Out, I'm Bill Woodle. We'll see you next week right here on Right Angle. Oh, and one more thing, by the way, before I forget, uh, one, one quick little uh, one quick little thing. This is for the Jetson manufacturers who may be looking for a spokesperson who's had a lot of experience <laughs> in the media. So, but but just one little thing. I, I, I know it must make that kind of rotor sound, but just just as a thought, if you could equip the vehicle with speakers so that it sounded like this, tell me it's not an improvement.